call the uh, September 11, uh, 2017 school committee meeting to order. Uh, uh, for tonight's meeting, uh, we'll start with public input, uh, and then go over the cons or this, uh, consent agenda, uh, continue our reading of the, our second reading of the accommodations policy, and then have a uh, budget discussion enter into executive session after that. Uh, RCTV is uh, running this meeting live. Uh, video by Rob. Uh, so first I'd like to, is there any public input for something that's not on the agenda tonight? Yes, Ms. Lieberman. Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. I just wondered if there's a date scheduled for an update of the uh, math curriculum, which was implemented. It's been five years since the new math curriculum was implemented, and this math curriculum uh, delays algebra until ninth grade for most students. Uh, this is in contrast to other districts. In fact, in 2015, Reading had the third lowest uh, lowest uh, num percentage of middle schoolers taking algebra of all the park districts in the state. Uh, I also would like to know when the math curriculum maps and pacing guides are scheduled to be completed for all grades. Thank you. Can we, uh, we do not have a date set for the math curriculum so we'll, review. It will be. We'll sit will, down and, yep. and we did. Make when sure. was the last one we had? It was, it was last year. We, we've had one in. Towards the end of the year. It was um, in January, early January, I believe. We'll make sure that you, you get that date. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I ask Yes. Um, will there also be in the packet an explanation, an update on the map in response to a letter that we received? That will be in the next packet. That will be in the next packet. We, because that response was done today, we didn't put it in today's packet. It'll be in the next. So there will be explanations. We're not waiting forever for um, an update on what the math program is doing. I the mean, the email response did capture all of that information. Yes. yes. Thank you. And thank you for that extensive explanation, Mr. Martin. Any anything else? I, I do have yes. a request um, that when you do review the consent agenda, if you could take the yep. clock donation out of it. Yep. I will, um, okay. ready? Do we have a motion? Yep. Um, move to remove the um, clock. Hold on. Uh, accepting a donation of the clock from the consent agenda. Is there a second? Yeah, just a brief word or two. Uh, Can you come yeah. up and sure. state your name for the television audience? Um, Joe Kane. I live at 22 Pearl Street. Um, I've been a teacher at Reading Memorial High School for a long time. Richard Nixon was president when I started. <laughs> <laughs> and about uh, 30 years ago, Virginia and Ad Adams and I uh, went through what was then the community center. It had been, it had been Reading High School from 1906 to 1954, and in 1954, this the, the old high school on Oakwood Road was built, and the community center was used for public meetings and uh, some sort of ancillary town offices. The town credit union was there, which is how I ended up going there in the daytime and nighttime for different town meetings. And I noticed uh, in the old principal's office was a a very pretty clock, which is now hanging out in the lobby here. Um, and before we turned the building over to developers to turn it into condominiums, um, Virginia Adams and I went through the school and picked out anything that we didn't want to have turned over to the salvagers. And uh, the closer I looked at this clock, in addition to being pretty, it was, a, it was an interesting curiosity was made by IBM and it was uh, the school department bought it in 1935 
and it's a combination, uh, it's an electromagnetic, electromechanical clock, which means it gets its power from electricity, um, but its timekeeping accuracy and function is controlled by a traditional clock mechanism with a pendulum. Um, and those kinds of clocks were made, electric clocks were made for individuals before World War II, but these institutional clocks that had uh, multiple synchronized clocks, like a hospital or a business office or a factory or a school, uh, were made by companies like IBM that did uh, time cards and date stamping and stuff like that. And uh, looked into getting the clock restored and it was because it was a weird, this electromechanical <coughs> device, uh, that wasn't practical. So uh, in the oh, early 90s maybe, uh, I put a quartz movement in it and uh, the pendulum's now uh, decorative rather than functional, but it keeps very good time because of the quartz movement. Um, and that, oh, this clock hung in the library of the media center at the high school from the early 90s through the renovation project uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And since then, it's sort of been bounced around. It's very heavy, so it, it, it would prefer to have a cinder block wall to hang on. And there are a lot fewer cinder block walls in the renovated building than in the old one. And that, for that reason, it's sort of been without a home. And uh, sometime this past spring, uh, I spoke to John about maybe putting it in here since I spotted the cinder block wall outside. And um, he agreed that it would be a good place for the clock to find a home. And I'm pleased to have it someplace where it'll be seen and appreciated for several more decades, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, thank you. Well, thank you for, and it's interesting to take a look at it. I wrote up a short little uh, yeah. Yeah. descriptor yeah. next to it that uh, gives you a little bit of history and a little bit of its uh, curiosity as a mechanical device. Appreciate the work that you put in and, that, and Mr. Trite to do oh, the refinishing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mention that. He's, he <coughs> donated the refinishing for it, um, as he's done for quite a s number of things around town that mm -hmm. are artifacts. And uh, he, was, he was wonderful in coming forward to do that. Mm -hmm. He's a neighbor on Pearl Street. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Okay. Six, zero. Okay. Any other? We, we get a vote on to accept that. Okay, and move to approve the um, acceptance of the donation of the clock. Is there a second? Six. Six, zero. Thank you. Oh, and he's getting a picture. We have uh, reports. Mario. And, oh, I'm sorry. Caitlin, did you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so there's not too much considering we're still in the first two weeks of school. Um, but the RM Interest Varsity football team did win their first home game this past Friday night against Wakefield. Um, uh, and also this Wednesday is back to school night. Uh, it's at it's from 6 30 to 8 30. Um, so if any, any parents are interested in attending that, Thank you. Dr. Nyan? Um, our FASA uh, did not attend the first meeting, but I do understand that um, there was a, this is recovery month, and um, the Board of Selectmen had a proclamation uh, noting that for the time of Reading uh, last Tuesday night. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight, um, so Rakasa has been working on Recovery Month, and isn't it in her packet here somewhere? Yeah, it's right here. Okay, sorry. Thank you. I was trying to find it. Um, so in addition to the fact that they were at the Fall Street Fair yesterday with a lot of other people who were here, I know we're at the Fall Street Fair, um, they'll be doing a presentation to the Rotary Club on the 18th, 
And then on the 20th, there's a Chamber of Commerce breakfast, so I really want to invite any um, business owners in Reading um, who would like to come to that. It's at 7.30 in the morning at the um, Fusion Cafe, and you can go online and find out about that and sign up for it. Um, and members of the Rakasa board will be there. Um, and then there is also a, um, a blanket making project on Friday the 22nd and 23rd at the First Congregational Church. Um, and then um, importantly, most importantly, here at Reading High on Thursday the 28th from 6 to 7 p.m. No, sorry, from um, 7 to 9. Um, at the annual meeting of RACASA, Dr. Ruth Pote will be a keynote speaker, um, and attorney um, uh, Marianne Ryan will also be there. Um, Dr. Pote is a uh, board certified family medicine, um, specializing in addictive medicine, and she's a physician in the Valley Medical Group. She's nationally recognized for her public speaking style that skillfully blends research and understanding of the challenges of raising healthy teens today. Um, she's really dynamic and sought after speaker, and I know that we've had her booked for many, many months. Um, so I know Erica met, um, actually met her and was able to secure her speaking engagement. So I really, um, if you can put nothing else on your calendars, put the 28th um, from 7 to 9 here at RMHS to see Dr. Pote, District Attorney. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of reports. Um, first of all, for the Special Education Parent Advisory Committee, there is a meeting this Thursday at 7 in the superintendent's <coughs> office here. There will be an election, I believe. Is that true, Alicia Williams? No, it's not this Thursday? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, can I ask what the agenda is? For the meeting? Yeah. Off the top of my head, no, it's a long agenda. There's a lot on it. Okay. So it's an important meeting to attend on this Thursday at 7. Um, and many thanks go to the people that have been organizing that group, including Alicia Williams. Thank you for filling me in. Um, I also um, am giving a very brief update on the Human Relations Advisory Committee. We didn't have a quorum on Thursday, so. We um, will have some informal minutes from that. Um, but the update from the Board of Selectmen is that the sunsetting of the committee was extended until the decision on whether or not to sunset the committee was delayed until December 1st. Um, I also am very sorry to report that I have resigned from the Human Relations Advisory Committee and my resignation letter can be found in the Board of Selectmen packet. Um, I also want to report that October 3rd is going to be a kickoff event for the committee that was formed to respond to the anti-Semitism and the hate that has been uh, rising in town as well as um, the country. And so uh, that will be at 7 p.m. There will be more information coming out about that. My thanks to Reverend Jamie Michaels of the Clergy Council in Old South for head, heading that, um, that organizing right now. And if you're interested in getting involved, please come to that event October 3rd. We're going to be, that's going to be the first of many events. Um, and it's going to be an exciting process to be a part of. We have a wonderful community. We saw it yesterday at the town fair. So we want to keep it that way and we want to connect people in positive ways. So please come on October 3rd at the Performing Arts Center at 7. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, this is a little unorthodox. So I'm going to ask your permission. I fielded a call from a parent uh, this week with a lovely story about an employee in our district and she specifically said I'd really like it if you shared it with the committee so I know it's a little unusual but I'll keep it brief but I did want to share this with the committee and the wider public a uh, parent reached out to me this week she's working on a beautification project at one of our schools um, a garden and asking for donations of mulch and plants and whatnot and one of our employees saw the work and commented on how grateful he was that she had embraced this project and then she proceeded to find him donating plants, mulch, and then found him on his hands and knees weeding the bed. <laughs> um, and she literally just called me to tell me what an amazing story that, <clears throat> excuse me, story that was. I asked if he was a Reading resident. He's not. I asked if he had kids in the system. He doesn't. 
he just saw some good work to be done and um, she wanted to share that. Uh, didn't want to embarrass by naming names, but wanted to share how touched she was by that. Um, and it made me think, I think we all know that that's happening every day in our schools, right? Our employees are going above and beyond in a million different ways, but I just, just want to acknowledge that story and share it with the community. Thank Thanks. you. <clears throat> Great. Yep. Um, I thought just very quickly I'd give you a brief update about some professional development that we've had throughout the course of the year. We, we have a number of different trainings scheduled aligned to our district goals. Um, and because we've been receiving some very positive feedback from our kindergarten staff, I thought I'd mention sort of some, uh, as an example of something going forward. Um, we have um, Dr. Martha Horn working with our kindergarten staff this year. Um, she began her work actually probably a few decades ago based on Donald Graves' research. Um, for those people who don't know, Donald Graves actually had some of the seminal research in the instruction of writing um, for students. He actually died several years ago, I think it was 2010 or 2011, but um, his books and research really sort of re revolutionized the way educators saw teaching writing to kids. Well, as an ELA person myself, um, it's so important to me to see the connection between reading and writing over the years. Um, there's always been a lot of research and evidence-based best practices about the teaching of reading, but not so much always when it comes to the teaching of writing. Um, many times as it's in the teacher preparation courses in college, you might have had very little in writing when there's a big focus on reading. Um, and so I think the writing part is very important. You know that's a focus that we have. <coughs> My own view is it's so connected to our own developing self, our, our not only helping kids with their critical thinking, but really finding their voice and who they are. And that so is interwoven, the reading and the writing, the input and output sort of thing in, in literacy. So we're excited to, to do that. Um, <coughs> Ms. Horn form formerly worked with Lucy Calkins at the Teachers College um, writing project. Um, she's currently a professor of education at Rhode Island College where she teaches reading and writing methods to both undergraduate and graduate prospective teachers. What I love about her also is that it, um, her instruction goes well beyond theory. She gets into the classrooms with her prospective teachers and does model lessons, um, discusses them with them. She observes their teaching. She works with individuals or small groups of children in front of them. So it really is a hands-on approach and she's got years of experience doing this. She's the author of the book Talking, Drawing, and Writing, Lessons for Our Youngest Writers, which was published several years ago and really lays the foundation for much of the work that we're doing this year. So, um, I mean, she's a really the expert in this area, so it's been great to be able to contract with her. Um, and when you see the way that kids respond to these opportunities as well, it's very, really very exciting. Um, in all candor um, and transparency, you know, the days, the time that we spent at the end of last week is far from the ideal time. We did hear from a few parents, very understandably, it's a difficult time right at the very beginning of the school year, especially with our youngest students, for the teachers to have some time out of class to do that. It weighed heavily on all of us, the, the administrative team weighing sort of do we miss this opportunity? Do we take it? It's best for teachers to do it as quickly at the beginning of the year as possible. So how do we do that? So we're definitely going to kind of work together as a team. And to leave it here again to help answer the questions that folks had and then if there are any additional questions. And as we mentioned throughout the year, we will be reporting as part of all the quarterly updates how we are trending in areas where we have seen any potential savings or overages. We'll be reporting that out at each one of our updates in pretty good detail for folks to understand where the items are coming out. The other item that also came up at the August 28th school committee meeting as part of Mr. Martin's update was what we had done for the science curriculum and the question came up as to how we spent the $150,000 and just as a quick reminder, the $150,000 was approved as part of the April town meeting. It was part of the fiscal 17 spend. So what um, we have done is included in the packet the slide that Mr. Martin went over with the associated spend with each line item to account for the $150,000. Thank you, Gail. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? 
I, thank you. I have a couple of things. Um, first, um, if you recall, the, at our last meeting when we introduced new teachers and administrators, um, there was one person that was not there, um, and she really wanted to come and introduce herself. So Brianne is here. <laughs> <laughs> Brianne Caro is the assistant principal at Coolidge. So welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank you for thank being you here. for coming. Thank, thank you. you. We, we heard like what our where did you get your degree? You know, we got that little report on everybody. Like, so, do you want to say where sorry. where you got your degree? And sure, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I went to uh, Syracuse <laughs> University, Big Orange, and the Big Oh yeah, Orange, <laughs> and um, and then I I went to uh, Syracuse and then went to Coolidge, and then went to Consortium to earn my admin license, and I've been teaching for nine years in Wilmington, and now it's my first year in Co at Coolidge, and it feels like home. It's almost every year. Excellent. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming tonight. Thank you for having me. And it's kind of a segue to my next point, um, not to embarrass Brianne, but yesterday Brianne was one of the people that was setting up tents and unloading vehicles for all of the vendors for the Fall Street Fair as a volunteer. Um, so thank you for that. Um, if you had an opportunity to go to the Street Fair yesterday, it was a tremendous success. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because the, the, there was a lot of school groups involved. There was a lot of school group booths. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, students that were performing uh, on one of the stages, either as part of dance groups or their own uh, individual groups um, that they have. Um, but clearly, uh, the students in the Reading Public Schools ha were were a major part of yesterday's Fall Street Fair. So I just I just wanted to thank them. Also, our staff were were very present. Um, some were in jail yesterday at the UD jail, yeah. but also some had booths. We had. Our foreign language department had a booth uh, to talk about the value of foreign language um, in, you know, in education and society. Um, the Reading Teachers Association had a booth as well. Um, I know they had finger painting going on and things like that. Um, we also had some of our uh, organizations that helped support our district were there. Ref was there. Our Casa was there. Uh, Rotary was there. Actually, they were the they were the ones that were, that led the whole Fall Street Fair. So overall, it was a very positive community day. And UD had the jail, right? And UD yeah. had the jail, right. Thank you. Can, yes. can I also add, um, that's a good opportunity to say what I missed. We also have the um, Human Relations Advisory Committee, two student liaisons who helped out at the fair also. So a special thank you went to, goes to Josh Lieberman and Tally Shore for their time um, helping out at the fair. And, and beyond. They were at the meeting on Thursday night, too. We also had our first round of um, back-to-school nights uh, last Wednesday. Our elementary schools were last Wednesday. Um, this week, uh, to, uh, Wednesday night, will be the high school, as you heard, the high school rise, preschool. And then on the 27th will be both of our middle schools. So um, I want to thank the teachers for um, their hard work and um, taking a night out of their schedules to to communicate to parents. It's always a very positive evening, lots of good energy that's going on. So that's that's all I have. Thank you. Go into the second reading of the accommodations policy. And I know Dr. Doherty uh, did you want to actually should I'll move to accept the second reading of the revised policy IMDA, Accommodations for Religious and Ethnic Observances. Second. Second. And before we vote, uh, Dr. Darty, do you want to talk about the, the memo? Yes. So um, before we begin, I, I, I was remiss in doing this last time, and I want to make sure I do it this time, that um, I want to thank uh, the parents and teachers and administrators that were part of the committee that we put together this summer to review the policy and make recommendations to the school committee. Um, we had two high school teachers, Bob Mooney and Jennifer Baskin, um, a middle school teacher, Rebecca Mandel. Uh, we had two parents, Kate Goldlust and Ann Schwartz, um, and three administrators, Julia Hendricks, the principal at Birch Meadow, Mike McSweeney, assistant principal at the high school, and Tom Zaya assistant principal at the high school. Um, the group met, as I said, last the last time uh, twice. Um, 
made some recommendations, and then we had a separate second meeting to look at the changes. And um, you know, that was the first policy that you saw uh, at the at the last meeting. What taking your feedback from the last time, um, I did some further research in how the uh, the feedback could be captured into the policy more effectively. So I reached out to, um, because the, the policy was, and I think even someone said it, the policy was a mixture of implementation and policy. And really it should be separate. You, you should separate the two. So I called, we called MASC. Um, they recommended, and which is done common um, in a lot of different policies, that you have the policy piece, which is much more broad, um, mirroring, mirroring more the law, um, and then you have what they would refer to as the regulations or the R. Um, so what you see are two separate documents here. Um, IMDA, which is the actual policy, and IMDA R, which are the regulations, which is really the implementation piece, the specificity. And this is the piece that um, would be communicated to staff on uh, how things are, are implemented. Um, I also put the policy by our legal counsel. Um, so our legal counsel reviewed it. They gave a couple of minor suggestions, and those are incorporated in here as well. So what you see here is a revised revision, I guess you could say revised revision, of the first reading that you had um, at the last meeting. Yeah, so this is a great reorganization. Uh, so thank you for, sp and I like splitting it into the regulations versus the policies. The, the one loose end that I, s I still have from our last set of comments, as I remember them, was just some adequate clarity around what parents need to do to ensure that their student is um, covered by this policy. So, and, and, and I can just point to just specific text references that I'm looking at, and maybe you can just answer these questions because they're really more on an administrative side but if we're going to vote on an administrative document with the regulations here I just want to make sure that there's sufficient clarity there so in the second page of the policy uh, Roman numeral 3 D 3 says any absence because of religious or ethnic holiday must be recorded as an excused absence so there has to be some kind of recording that goes on of this according to the policy that's consistent with what with the law is when we turn to the regulations then, it's a question of, well, how do you do that? How, how, how does a parent accomplish that? Uh, and so in the first page of the recommendation under Roman numeral one sub C, administrators have to communicate to parents uh, or, and the teachers to let them know that their child will be absent for religious observances. To, so to me, that means it has to be a notice given before the, uh, before the holiday occurs. And if you go down to part three of the policy, parents and students, it says parents are encouraged to notify the school in advance. Um, I, I, I'm assuming we, we have standard uh, regular reporting processes for any absence. And so what I'm looking for for parents is, when does the notice have to be given? What is acceptable notice? Is it an email to the principal? Is it a phone call? Is there a deadline? So maybe you can just clarify that because this, can, can a parent after the holiday retroactively put their student on the list? Sure. And, and if you clarify that, and, and I'd like to see it clarified in the document for parents as well who might not see this meeting. In the regular school policy, I mean, it's what the regular absence Yeah, is. so a, a parent is required to call their child absent in for any reason. Um, the parent, it's the parent's choice. Okay. The parent doesn't have to tell us that their child is out for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but but if they want the benefit of this policy, right? Right. They they, they would they would indicate that it that it's for the religious holiday. So if we just had a cross-reference under Roman numeral Th This is just for the attendance we're talking about. That's oh, I, all, I that's all we're talking about. I understand, but there's some, some absences on these days will receive the benefit of this policy, and some absences won't. No. It, not every, every, every student across Reading doesn't necessarily, if they're absent, not because they're observing a religious holiday, but they're absent, then, then the normal absentee policy would apply to that student, not this policy, right? No, the only students that would get a different... Um, marking for the attendance would be the ones that say that they're out that's, for religious that's, reasons. That's what that's I'm saying. What that's that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is how, how, does the, how does the school know, how do parents make sure that the school knows that they get the benefit of 
It's that's what that's, one it's three dot one. It's a, everybody. If if you're talking about the the um, due dates or things like that, that's no. oh, you're just talking about the attendance. It says part? must be recorded as an excused absence. What makes it an excused absence on page one in in the regulations of this policy? Because I don't see because it. it doesn't say that. Will not be attending because of religious or ethnic observance. That's I, I'm just saying it says encouraged in three. It doesn't say like this is how you receive the benefit of this policy. That's to me, it's not clear. Okay, it's not clear whether a, a parent can call in after the holiday and say retroactively, my student was absent for a religious whatever observant reason, whatever get the benefit of this policy. I, there's just a lack of clarity here to me in the regulations. May I, May I just ask what the hold on, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. just when you say receive the benefit of the policy, what All do you mean by that? I'm just, I'm just, do you just mean the, uh, the this excused policy. Abs absence, or do you mean everything about due dates and makeup and all of that kind of stuff? That's what I think I'm confused about. When does this policy apply? It applies on these no major non-national religious holidays, and it applies to all, to it applies to all students. So the policy is being enacted, and in the Journey <coughs> newsletter, Dr. Doherty, published this week, it basically indicates to all staff and administrators, right, that these are the major non, um, <clears throat> major non-national religious holidays that are coming up, and these, this policy applies, so there will be no assignments, no tests, no one-time events. For all students. For all students. So We even specified the dates, we specified everything. So, so the only... That, the question was, would the, you, you're looking for something other than if courage. If I'm, I'm a parent, what do I do? What, what I don't know. I still don't know. You I've don't read know. this three times. I Wait, still don't know what, what I have to do. To receive the benefit of the policy or to just yeah. take care of the absence? They, you oh. have to call in. Every, anytime your child does, anytime you do not force your child to attend school, you have to call in, right? You have to call, and I, I don't, usually you have, you're supposed to call the same day. Generally, if you don't call that day, the school ends up calling you and says, Mrs. Webb, do you know that your son did not come to school today? And hopefully I will say, yes, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I, I held him home. So what a parent has to do if you want to not have that absence marked as unexcused, you have to call in. Now, if my son or daughter happens to be absent on one of these days because they are sick with the flu, I'm going to call in and report that they're sick with the flu. But if uh, Linda's son or daughter was attending a religious service, then she's going to call in and say, probably that they were, you know, this isn't should be an excused absence because we were attending religious services. So that's the that's what parents do, and I think that's what's covered in three. You just you yeah, but, notify the school, but maybe it's the word encourage. So Dr. Doherty, when you talk to, to to Mike Gilbert, or I don't know that he was that that the R. This is the R piece that Mike. No, Gilbert it was legal counsel. I talked to. So about, why yeah. wouldn't they have told? us to put in there parents and students if age appropriate are required to notify I mean if you're not if you want the benefit of the policy you got to call in and, and I think say why encouraged is but, is kind of a but you know it's can, well, can and it says must I mean no. I, I just want to be clear it says must be recorded as an excused absence for religious observance must that's the policy so I want to know as a parent when I turn to the regulations how must I do that? If it's in accordance with the existing reporting uh, policy, that's fine. Just reference that, and I'm good with this. All right, we just that's have fine. to be able to correct this somehow. Okay. It'll be, I'll, I'll, it'll be but can we, yeah. can we correct, yeah. amend we, it and we ask have, this? We, 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 yes, we can. Because because we have, we have, all, we have always communicated to parents ahead of time. We've always communicated to parents ahead of time that if they are, their child is going to be out for religious reasons, that they let us know. But I think yes. the difference is the parents are not required to report it beforehand, but they're being encouraged to say it at least in the note afterwards when they report it. You're not required to do it in advance, but they're being encouraged to do it afterwards. Do we require reporting in advance for their same day reporting for absences? Yes. Or do we permit after the fact reporting? Yeah. If someone's sick, we we Can always we the school always so, calls if they don't hear from the parents. Right. So could could I make a motion to amend this in well, a way that I think is not controversial? Uh, Ms. Borowski, yeah. No, no, keep going. Could I ask one question? Since um, we're almost of course. Of course. Well, people who um, did the, the policy. It's just a question no. about the tests. Is there no. any flexibility in here? No. 
No, Mrs. So Silverman, I don't what, think what, that, what, I'm sorry, did, what was the question? Oh, I just wondered if there's any flexibility because as somebody who uh, does observe the holidays, for my kids it's sometimes easier to have a scheduled test and make that up versus missing classwork. So is there any flexibility for teachers in this policy? If, uh, if uh, my student negotiates with the teacher? No. The whole, the whole yeah, idea behind the policy was not to have students, and Mr. Bowman brought this up quite frequently, not to have students have to go negotiate with their teacher and, and set themselves aside. Dr. Thanks. That was if, I can just, if I can just say, there is no test schedule right. for any student None. Okay. on religious holidays. None. Okay. No assignments? No assignments tests, to do no one on religious event. holidays. That was or, not true last year. Or the day yeah. after. Well, yeah. Okay, the, right. this is the policy. So I'm just clarifying. Just clarifying. Yeah. Thank you. So Mr. Bowman has a... Motion. So I would, I would, the motion would be on the end of the regulations in set Roman numeral three, and I'm, I'm just trying to make the regulations consistent with the, uh, with the policy in front of it. It would be to add a number three that just says um, notification to the school will be done in accordance with applicable. Uh, Dr. Darty, what's the term for absentee reporting? The absentee verification line. Yeah. That, that we would just carry that forward here, that we're using the, the we're, normal. I'm sorry, we're, I, I don't Oh, to... Roman numeral three at the very end of the document. Not, I, no, number three under Roman numeral. Oh, I got yeah, you. Add, In the implementation guidelines. Guideline. Yes. Yes, please. Got it. That and it would just be adding a, a number three that just says. Should be in accordance with this. Will be in, notification to the school will be in accordance with normal process for reporting an absence. How, yeah, it, what, Dr. Gardy, you can provide the term yep. to, to execute this in the right, you know, language consistent with the rest of the rule book. But that, that's all I'm saying. We have, we have a, a policy that says on the one hand, you must do this, and then a, a regulation that doesn't really, in my mind, tell you how. Um, the, the other thing. Do we yeah. want to vote on that Hold on, amendment? Vote on the amendment, right? Vote on the amendment yeah. first, and then the so, amended I'll, policy. But you weren't finished yet, right? No, it's just, I wanted to make one separate. It's just a separate point. Just, just to recognize that this policy goes beyond what the law requires. So this, the law requires accommodation for students for academic activities. This policy goes beyond that to extracurricular activities. And just to make people aware of that, that the, the policy chooses to go beyond what the law requires to uh, restrict um, in some fashion um, extracurricular activities for students that are protected by this policy. That's all. So there was um, yeah. a motion. Yes. Hold on. Oh, sorry. I have a clarification on the wording of this. John has the wording. So um, my question is, if this number three is added, does that mean that a parent who says in advance that their student isn't going to be there is still going to need to call in on their holiday no. to say why their student is absent? I mean, with the, the amendment that's being proposed. So, um, Mr. Bob made an amendment to add um, number. Yeah, motion to yep, to section three. The um, motion to add the statement um, that notification to the school will be in accordance with the standard absentee reporting policy. Yep. Um, yes. Second. Is there a second? second? Any more discussion? We'll take a vote on the amendment. Those in favor of the amendment to the policy? Now, now we, is there any other discussion on the policy? As amended. Not seeing none, are we ready to vote on the policy as amended? All those in favor? 6 0, Linda. <coughs> yes. I just wanted to say I really appreciated the work of the parents and, and Dr. Darty this yeah, summer, so and I absolutely. also appreciated the creative approach taken to incorporate the, com the conversation and recommendations last meeting, that the separation really does address a number of things, and um, including um, the information that I asked for to make sure people understood the, the definition, the boundaries of the holidays. So thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Well, the next item on the agenda was the uh, guiding principles discussion and thank you to uh, everybody for, for providing those uh, 
I guess the way I see it at this point, uh, last year we did this a little bit differently. We we went around the room and and stated what our um, uh, thoughts were, and Dr. Darty wrote them down and then went off, went off and presented the budget. So I don't. I think we the only, the difference this year is we put it in writing. So I really don't see a discussion tonight. I just see now you have the guidance and uh, you go back and uh, try to craft that and a budget based on that. And then I'd also say that uh, you know if you if there's any questions about any individual committee. Uh, that might be make sense to reach out to them individually yeah, and absolutely. talk about it. Uh, this, and so, does anybody on the committee have? Sounds good. Just, sounds yes. Good. I just wanted to share that I heard from two members of the public how much they appreciated seeing this in writing. I think it, it, it's getting the conversation going in a productive way. So, I wanted to thank you for doing it this way. I'm so sorry. Did you have anything else to add? Um, no, the only thing is, is that you know we'll, we'll we'll be putting together a recommended budget to the school committee, and um, then it's the school committee's purview to um, make changes or accept the budget as is, and um, what would turn into the budget that's recommended to the finance committee. Um, we will certainly use these guiding principles to the best of our ability. I mean, obviously, there are some that. Kind of counter each other, but um, you know, so we'll makes the world go around. That's right. <laughs> when we report back, we'll look to work. include any responses right. or areas where there may have been differing opinions as part of the overall presentations that we do in January. We'll look to incorporate this feedback as part of it so that everyone can see how we address the guiding principles because I think that'll be another important part is to anywhere where we may or may not have been able to stick to exactly what was in here for discussion purposes. Yes. One, one point to add that I thought would be helpful, when we do get around to rolling out the, the budget presentations, I think it would be helpful to have an explanation up front. So typically we jump right into cost center number one and, and we go right into the numbers in my experience. I think it would also be helpful just to explain the the thinking of how you went about putting together the budgets and, and how you applied or balanced these principles as you did it. And to kind of start with the story, because there, there is a story that you're going through, and, and it's an iterative process, as, as I've experienced it in the past, where you, you go through the, the process gradually in a very detailed way, but along the way, you're, you're making decisions about how to balance these competing priorities and limited resources. So if, if at the end you can bring the the public into that, you know, the alternatives considered maybe or something, just to give a little bit of a story instead of just this enormous amount of information, which is, is very thorough, it's very transparent, that's all appropriate, we don't want to change that, but if you can kind of scaffold it a little bit for everyone listening, I think it's helpful because you guys are very, very close to these numbers, but for people coming from the outside, it's, it can be really overwhelming. So anything, you can, so at, along the way, if you can take some notes to decide, well, you know, we're, we're going to prioritize this over that or and then you can follow those breadcrumbs as you put together your presentation in January uh, to help remember your thinking in you know, October, November. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I would say that that would be in the uh, thank you. Uh, that would be in the uh, introduction introduction where where the budget does or does not address uh, the various priorities. The overview. Yeah. Right. I would think right. The superintendent's message generally has included that lay of the land, sort of, and, and some of the struggles, uh, and, tra and maybe trade-offs. We can definitely do that. All right, we have, um, that was our last. Uh, I think we have executives. Because that was, that concludes the uh, open session agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, we we do have an executive set up. Yep. So, yep.
move to enter into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining and not to return to open session. Second. Yes. 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 